We are peacefully gathered here. Amen. In the tradition of Martin Luther King, Gandhi. This multiracial gathering is possible because of nonviolence. And that is the heartbeat of democracy that you hear. The Friday, about six days after Michael Brown was so viciously killed, um, I got on a plane and I flew back in time uh, and saw a moment uh, that looked both familiar but new. It's the youth who have led us, it's the young adults, it's the movement age folks who have given us that urgency and that energy and, and, and opened us to new ways of seeing what the future could hold. We have not seen the likes of this since the 60s. The number of protests worldwide, it's unprecedented. It's black, it's poor, it's queer, it's woman-led. It is profane, nonetheless holy. The force of that moral wisdom that's grounded in the principles is what attracts people to follow that leadership because they realize there's love there. They, they realize that there's healing, there's creativity, there's hope, there's a way forward. There was apparently a convocation of pastors in Europe right on the, the brink of the war. In fact, so much on the brink that the war broke out when they were together in this conference. And one of them, I think, was the chaplain uh, to the Kaiser, uh, Friedrich Sigmund Schultz. And another was a Quaker from England, Henry Hodgson. On the train platform, as they were about to leave, they shook hands and said they wouldn't let this war come between their fellowship, their relationship. So we mark the founding of the International Fellowship of Reconciliation there in 1914. These early FOR members worked to defend the rights of conscientious objectors. Roger Baldwin would lead the formation of the National Civil Liberties Bureau, which would become the American Civil Liberties Union. John Nevin Sayer led peace delegations to Nicaragua. A.J. Musty trained leaders of organized labor before becoming executive secretary in 1940. A.J. Musty of the Fellowship of Re Reconciliation got in touch with me and he asked me would I work part-time for the FOR organizing in the Chicago area. We set up what we call the number of cell groups. One of them was on the campus of the University of Chicago. And one Saturday, they went to a restaurant on 63rd Street, and there were a few service. Well, they were studying nonviolence at that time, Gandhi and Shudarani and Greg and so forth. Said, well, we ought to do something about this. Bayard Rustin was on the staff of the FOR in New York at that time. Bayard had an absolutely electric impact on me. I went to hear him. He was at a FOR conference. We will stay in these damn streets until every Negro in the country can vote. And I could imitate Bayard for weeks after that. I mean, I just, his accent, his gestures. Um, so long before I had read anything about Gandhi, I had really become a Gandhian based on absorbing uh, Bayard. A few years later, FOR members organized the first Freedom Ride. In 1944, a woman named Irene Morgan got on a bus in Virginia bound for Maryland. When she was told by the driver to give her seat to a white passenger, she refused and was arrested. The NAACP led by Thurgood Marshall took the case to the Supreme Court. The court ruled in Irene Morgan's favor, banning the practice of segregation on interstate bus travel. It would be FOR members Rustin and Hauser who set out to test the new ruling by creating the Journey of Reconciliation. 
Bard and I recruited uh, 16 people, eight black and eight white. We traveled for two weeks. There were 12 arrests, three of our group uh, spent 30 days on the road gang in North Carolina. Byron Rustin, Egon Rodenko, and Joe Felman. FOR's engagement in the civil rights struggle extended far beyond bus segregation. FOR member James Lawson played a key role in the launch of the direct action movement and the creation of SNCC. On the eve of his assassination, Martin Luther King called Lawson the leading theorist and strategist of nonviolence in the world. There was another FOR member, Alfred Hassler, who would have a stroke of genius for spreading the word about the Montgomery bus boycott. My father, who was at that time the head of publications at the FOR, um, had an idea, and his idea was to create a comic book about Martin Luther King. When I was a student in 1957, 17 years old, there was a comic book called Martin Luther King Jr. and the Montgomery Story. It was published by an organization called the Fellowship of Reconciliation, and it sold for 10 cents. It's told how the Montgomery Bus Walk I was organized. And we started attending the nonviolent workshop. It was like a blueprint. The Montgomery story would go on to sell hundreds of thousands of copies and be translated into many languages. With the outbreak of war in Vietnam, FOR again went into action with Hassler as executive secretary. Building on FOR's legacy of support for conscientious objectors, the fellowship became a central point for educating, training, and supporting young men who registered for CO status, as well as the growing network of draft resistors who resisted conscription. The fellowship launched dramatic methods of raising consciousness about the war, including nonviolent civil disobedience actions to disrupt the government the Daily Death Toll Project, and two massive national mobilizations that drew more than half a million people to rally against the war. It was Hassler and the peace delegations that he led that would introduce a young Buddhist monk to the world. One of the things that Thich Nhat Hanh brought with him was a scientific understanding of what the impact of war was on the environment. And the De Dong, the, uh, the movement uh, that created a conversation around scientists related to environmental issues that are really a part of the climate change conversation today. So you have poverty over here, you have uh, you know, wars over here, you have climate change, you have uh, continued gun violence. I'm not saying FOR is unique, but it, it sees the interface between all of those. During the Cold War, FOR continued its long history of reaching across national and political boundaries. The primary focus had to be people-to-people -people delegations with Russia, the Soviet Union, and disarmament work. The Soviet Peace Committee had certain rules that you don't talk to this one, you don't talk to that one, you know, you come over here, you, we said, ha ha, we'll be happy to come, we'll send many different delegations, but we talk to everybody. People to people delegations continued to create understanding and empathy across cultural and geographic boundaries. The Palestinians are our teachers in how to struggle. And therefore, as a person who learned the Jewish lesson that who is wise, one who learns from everyone. They are my teachers. They inform and have always informed how I struggle for justice. No one thing is gonna change, um, you know, is gonna alter how conflicts get resolved. It's a combination of things. So when I came back, I gave up, I think, around 50 presentations to community groups, um, church groups, you know, social clubs, college classes um, about the trip. Wherever the U.S. military sent troops and bombs, FOR sent peace delegations, places like East Asia, the Middle East, and of course, Latin America. The FOR had a long history in Latin America that went back to 1919 shortly after the FOR was founded. In 1927, uh, John Nevin Sayer, who I believe was the executive secretary at that time, led a small group to Central America at a time uh, of a lot of U.S. intervention in the region. They visited several countries, and in Nicaragua, 
They actually attempted to mediate between the Marines and the uh, rebel forces, which were led by uh, Augusto Sandino. The Fellowship has always relied on a deep commitment to the principle of intersectionality and learning how to cope with challenges. And in my mind, protective accompaniment in Latin America is a kind of continuation of the Fellowship of Reconciliation's work in the South with the freedom movement in the 1950s and 60s. You're standing with people who are vulnerable and who are threatened at the same time as you're working to change your own nation's policies that are perpetuating and making that violence worse. Since the 1930s, FOR has nurtured an interfaith network of peace fellowships. When the Bosnian war broke out, the imam of our mosque, uh, Sheikh Tosun Barak, went to Bosnia to see what could be done to help the people who were under threat there. The Yugoslavian university system had completely collapsed. The um, Serbian initiative at the time was to wipe out the Bosnian intelligentsia. The University of Zagreb was one of the best academic institutions in the former Yugoslavia. And I was watching a war which included a genocide in which Christians were killing Muslims in the name of God. So uh, Tosna Fendi came back to this country, having set up a student organization there, and started to send letters around to universities to see can we get scholarships. Of the 300 letters that he sent out, he got one response. He said, clearly we don't have any credibility, so we have to look for someone who has credibility to partner with us in this enterprise. And he remembered that some years previous, when we were tr first trying to build our mosque, and we had a lot of difficulty building in this neighborhood, at one of these interminable zoning board hearings, somebody stood up and actually said, well, I think it would be a good idea to have a mosque in the neighborhood. And we said, who is this? And that was Richard Dietz. I remember one of the board members who had fought me on this, tooth and nail, saying, no, FOR, we teach peace. We don't do social work. And he said, you know, when those two students came here, suddenly the Louisville community understood what I was trying to teach, what I was trying to say about peace for the last 20 years, because we were actually doing it. While FOR has continued its dedication to civil rights and to interfaith peace projects, the nonviolent actions they initiated have been adopted by people seeking justice everywhere. The simple comic book created by Alfred Hassler continues to spawn new and unique ideas for spreading the strategies of nonviolence. Your new book is called March Book One. This is a graphic novel. It's essentially a comic book of your early days in the civil rights movement. I started to, uh, to uh, have the, the great tools to do this was in 2006 when I was introduced to Martin Luther King and his Martin legacy. Luther King. Exactly. So after, after that, I worked with my organization, AIC, on translating a comic book about Martin Luther King. And I'm so happy to say that when, when, when I was translating this, we used this term, nonviolent action, and translated it into Arabic. It was very new to people then. So now it's used everywhere. It's, uh, it's used in all the revolutions happening all over the region. And the book was distributed everywhere to educate people how to make it happen. We don't fight all day and night until we get it right. Which side are you on, my people? Which side are you on? We on the free side. In its 100th year, FOR has again answered the call for nonviolent action. At one level, I'm just really catching up. Like, I'm, you know, I didn't plan this, they planned it. They told me what they were gonna do, when they was gonna do it. I said, well, all right, let me, they, I'm, I'm following them, literally. It was their march, they ran this. I'm not these young people leader. They don't listen to me. They listen to me, we went a march as far as we did today. You know what I'm saying? I'm just here to give some advice, some wisdom. As an elder, try to give them a little safe, make sure they're safe. So, you know, this is a generation saturated with hip hop, and that's what they're doing with social movements. They're taking the little, you know, little FOR, little Martin Luther King, a little, little Asada Shakur, and they're remixing it and producing something else. I don't know, to quote a 17th century Baptist pastor whose name I can't remember right now, uh, God sets us at different angles to the truth. <laughs> 
talking about solidarity, talking about self-determination, talking about truth in this generation means confronting our weaknesses and working to correct them to get stronger. And I want, to, I want us all to remember that it is our faith and our spirituality that give us the principles to move forward with this and that we all need to work together to help each other grow internally and externally as well. And inshallah, uh, together we can do this. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Baruch Hashem. I think they might be the salvation of the nation and the salvation of fellowship of reconciliation. Follow them in the streets. And they'll take you places that eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. And we might all be free. There's a story about a place told a long time ago About a city where the streets are paved with gold Everybody got a place to stay and food to eat Long white robes and gold slippers on their feet I'm talking about heaven. I'm talking about heaven. I'm talking about heaven. Heaven. Talking about talking about heaven. Heaven. I'm talking about. study war no more they laid down their burdens and they picked up joy all the angels drive Cadillacs and the devil got a Rolls Royce too we finally got what they owed us 40 acres and a mule I'm talking about it I'm talking about heaven. I'm talking about heaven. I'm talking about.